Well, hello, everybody. This is Douglas Reeves at the Leadership and Learning Center. I'm joined by Lisa Selebeck, about who I'll tell you. Um, you're going to receive a taste today in our discussion of how to implement the Common Core Standards at a deeper level. In surveys that we've conducted of thousands of educators and school leaders um, in the states that are adopting the Common Core, there isn't a lot of mystery about what the Common Core is, but there is considerable anxiety over how to do it and how to go from simply being aware that these things are coming down the pike busting the myth that you don't have to worry about them until 2014, and uh, really helping people get ready for implementation right now. Um, you can see that there are many opportunities across uh, uh, the United States to participate in those. And uh, I'd recommend you talk to my colleague, Brooke Little, whose name is at the bottom there, blittle at leadandlearn.com for more information. Um, we've also got some one-day summits coming up uh, in Sacramento and New Orleans again. Uh, Brooke is the one who's best equipped to tell you about that. And of course, opportunities like we have today give you a, a great opportunity. Uh, the handouts are available at leadandlearn.com. Um, my colleague um, Adam can tell me whether or not they are already posted, or Adam, will they be posted at the end of this webinar? They are not already posted, but they will be posted at the end of the webinar at okay, www.leadandlearn.com slash webinars. Great. That's www dot lead, L-E-A-D, A-N-D, L-E-A-R-N, leadandlearn.com slash webinars, and you'll be able to find all of these handouts. We're always happy to, to share them and encourage you to do so with your colleagues who may want to participate in future webinars. Um, in addition, we've provided some resources that are just incredibly helpful, um, and I'm greatly indebted to my colleagues for putting this together in a teacher-friendly way that you can go uh, from what the Common Core say to precisely how to link these to your curriculum and to your, um, and to your classroom activities. Uh, these are immediately available, and, uh, and I commend them to you, short, approachable books. Finally, a leadership summit. John Hattie, whose uh, face you see there, and a number of other speakers, Brian McNulty, internationally known for his writing on leadership, you'll have the opportunity to work in smaller groups uh, with them. If you're a senior leader at a school or district level, or perhaps at a state provincial or national level, uh, this would be a good opportunity uh, for you to think about what are these specific leadership issues that are most important in improving student achievement. I know that even though we're still technically in February, those summer calendar dates get filled very, very rapidly. And before they do, uh, we'd love to have you participate. And I'd certainly personally like to see you as well. Uh, the Senior Leadership Institute brings together um, a, a group of, of uh, experienced leaders and, uh, and authors and researchers who will be talking about new leadership and new challenges. If you've seen any of my presentations lately, you know that we are focused on 2012 evidence and what I've broadly called moving from the rearview mirror, what worked elsewhere in somebody else's schools, to the windshield, what's working right now in your schools. Um, so um, I'm going to start with a poll. And the questions that you see up there are going to be replaced by a real poll. And that is at what stage you would say you are right now. So let's launch this poll. I'll give you about 30 seconds to, um, to respond. It's very interesting to me that although we've done this um, numerous times, there is a consistency over the thousands of people who have participated in our webinars about what these results are showing that a significant plurality of you, 42%, have been introduced to the Common Core documents. The what is not the problem. They've been out now for over a year. But look at that 12%. It's implementing the Common Core state standards K-12 to on a consistent basis. Some of you are just getting started. Some of you need to be more, more familiar with the, with the document. But the biggest challenge is, is uh, only about 10 or 12% of us are actually implementing. And let me just explain why I think Lisa and I have a sense of urgency about that. There are some particular parts of the Common Core State Standards, notably the increase in informational writing, and for many states, a significant increase in rigor at middle school math, that will be a sea change for curriculum. If you wait until 2014 for the implementation, you're going to be giving teachers the very difficult um, task of trying to do a couple of years worth of catch up in one year. If by contrast, we work on the implementation issues, as all of you are today, then you're going to give yourself a reasonable opportunity to 
ask, what do we need to do in schedule? What do we need to do in terms of adjusted curriculum? How much time will teachers and students need to be where they need to be? And for many of them, it's not going to be one class period a day. So let me just thank you for your candor and your honesty. Your results today are very consistent with what we're seeing in other systems um, across the United States. So let's get to um, let's get to work. And as I introduce my my colleague Elisa, let me just say a few words about her. Uh, she is a professional developer with the Leadership and Learning Center. Before working full time with us, um, Lisa was a secondary literacy coach. She's provided job embedded professional development at the district and school level. She also has taught in the English language arts classroom. So she practiced what she facilitates and has seen firsthand increased student achievement that can occur when students are engaged and have high expectations and are held accountable. She's also been directly involved in our Common Core work, designing Getting Ready for the English Language Arts Common Core State Standards and co-authoring a brand new core literacy seminar designed to provide strategies for uh, teachers to meet and the new reading and writing demands of the Common Core. She also contributed to our new book series getting ready for the Common Core book series. So Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I would like to start with just an overview of the ELA Common Core. And I know we're moving from the what to the how, but let's just back up for a moment and discuss some what or some key points um, regarding the English Language Arts Common Core. First of all, the full title is Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts and Literacy in History, Social Studies, Science, and technical subjects. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to reinforce that this is literacy for everybody. A few people have questions to say, well, what about in math or other subject areas? And if you look at the introduction material of the Common Core, it does insist that the instruction in reading, writing, speaking, listening, language be a shared responsibility within the school. So even though we have certain subjects listed in the title besides English language arts, it is insisted that it's a shared responsibility in the school. And that is a great starting point for this discussion. Really quick, um, kindergarten through fifth grade teachers, they, you teach all subjects. So literacy comes naturally as a part of your everyday job in all subject areas. We want to make sure that um, each grade level is, is promoting that. That's how the standards are, are embedded. But at the sixth grade level is where it splits out. So sixth through twelfth grade you have standards for the English language arts teachers. But then 6th through 12th grade, you have standards for the non-English language arts teachers. And that is where literacy is so important. If you see that first point there under the three big ideas, literacy is everyone's job. So now we have reading and writing really in every classroom. The second point there is the um, text complexity, back on that well, the other slide. And that is that text complexity is something that is it must be done independently and proficiently at every discipline. And so it's at every grade level now, according to the Common Core, students need to be able to read at their grade level before moving on. So there's that complex text that's going to be um, a big part of this. The last point there is that students must write argumentative and explanatory text for every discipline. And what we're seeing is the huge push for nonfiction writing. In fact, by the end of 12th grade, students should really be writing at 80% nonfiction versus to convey experience or fiction. Moving on to the math, we have the math title there, Common Core State Standards for Mathematical Content and Mathematical Practices. I like to have that title up because many people are not noting the mathematical practices. They have to be taught together. They go in tandem with each other. And so when we're talking about the mathematical content, the standards, we are also talking about the eight mathematical practices that are embedded at every grade level, kindergarten through 12th grade, and are so important. Looking at the big ideas behind math, going on to the next slide, it's really key to remember that there are critical areas of focus. And at every grade level, before you even start looking at the standards, the Common Core lays out key critical areas for a teacher as a reference point. So if that's your starting point and you're just digging through math now, look for the critical areas of focus. At the high school level, you can assign them in the Appendix A. 
And the second really key point is that you have to start the mathematical practices now. Don't wait till 2014, 2015. Students need to understand how to persevere. Students need to work with modeling. There are all these key things that really are going to change the way we teach math in the math classroom. The last point there really is there's no right answer. And that by that, we mean that students really need to be able to struggle in math. So that perseverance needs to come through. They really need to work and dig and find out what's wrong or that there's many ways to get to a right answer or to be able to break things apart and pull them back together. A lot of times we're focused on one problem for a long time. For example, in the new um, assessments we'll talk about a little bit later on in 2014-2015, a student might work on one math performance task for an entire session or even possibly two sessions. So the way we're teaching math in the classroom is changing. Now at this point what we'd like to do is to uh, get, hear again from you and we'll launch another poll to ask where's the area based on your perspective, whether it's classroom, school, or district, where you see the need for the greatest amount of support. So if you please take about 30 seconds to, if you're working with a group, come to a consensus. If you're working alone, give us your best answer. That's the poll question and we'll close it in about 30 seconds. And let's take a look at what you had to say. So again, a very strong plurality are looking for high impact instructional practices. That's going to be true, of course, no matter um, uh, what the standards are. And the rest of us are somewhat divided between leading of implementation and curriculum development. You know, if I could summarize uh, the, both these results and the feelings that I've had uh, from a lot of teachers around the country, it is that standards are not enough, particularly those who went through the standards 1.0 movement of the early and mid-1990s where a lot of wheelbarrows worth of three ring binders had been delivered to the door, there's a clear recognition that it's going to be the classroom work, curriculum, implementation, and high impact instructional strategies that are going to be most necessary. So that's a good segue, Lisa, for you to take us into uh, the next area, from what to how. Um, from the what to the how, and that is where we have uh, as according for the teachers, if you looked into the Common Core documents, it says what is not covered by the standards. It says the standards define what all students are expected to know and to be able to do, not how teachers should teach. So I think that's where a lot of the, the anxiety or the level is, is because what is our starting point there? So if we look at here at this slide called the power of prioritizing, um, that is a great place to start. Again, with the Common Core, we do have many standards, even though they're fewer and clearer, and of course more rigorous, we still can be overwhelmed with, with how many standards there actually are, especially if your state that you're in has included an extra 15% on top of the Common Core standards. So a great place to start is, is with prioritizing the standards. And for example, what Doug had said before, and, and re I reinforced is that that the writing standards are so important, the argumentative and the explanatory, and text complexity in reading. And so there are certain key areas you might want to think about as you prioritize. But going through Larry Inc. with um, prioritizing and unwrapping standards is a great place to start so that not only do the, do the teachers start to really look at the standards closely, um, but they can know what students are, the skills students are supposed to be able to do and what they know and, and how they're going to go ahead and, and then have conversations around how to teach them. I, I would just add, Lisa, briefly that, that there are some people who think that this is controversial because the standards already are all laid out in, in sequence. There's just nothing that can possibly be left out. And I just want to offer two points for our webinar participants to consider. Uh, that theory would be true. That is, everything fits together. It's one year of curriculum very neatly if and only if you happen to be lucky enough to have students who only need one year of learning. But every time I'm on these calls and in these presentations, we have a significant number of people whose students need more than one level of, of learning. And unless you're going to try to cover everything in a couple of years' worth of standards, you will need to make some choices that some standards have more leverage, have more power than others. Uh, if we fail to do that, then what in fact happens 
is that we don't really have the illusion of covering everything. Some things slip off by the end of the year. The question is, should that prioritization be done deliberately or accidentally? And we believe that it ought to be by a very deliberate process that we call priority standards. Um, and that's going to continue to be necessary as long as there are kids who need more than one level of learning. And going into instructional practices here, it's that reinforcing the, the, the how. How are we going to change teachers' practice in the classrooms? And if you start with the standards and you prioritize your standards, that's going to give teachers a much more focused area to work with their with their colleagues, to have collaboration around, to talk about how do we move forward with instructional practices. The one support that we have is we know that the Common Core has been defined as um, research and evidence-based. It aligns with the college and work expectations. They're rigorous and, and thankfully they're internationally benchmarked. So we have that starting ground for us. We, we know the evidence is behind these standards. Now, what is the evidence or the research in best in instructional practices to move forward? So as an administrator, how are you going to support your teachers changing their practice in the classroom? As a teacher, how do you know what to change or how to change your practice? So we have some key um, areas to, to support you with the Leadership and Learning Center. And one, um, one exciting piece of information here is Doug moved on to the next slide is Dr. Hattie's work. So I'll let Doug speak to that. Yeah, this is the most exciting thing to happen in, in education in a very long time. Uh, you see the book here, Visible Learning, that was the start of it all. Most recently, there's a 2012 book that I really commend to you, learning, Visible Learning for Teachers. And everywhere I go, people are doing book studies um, on this. It's the result of more than 900 meta-analyses, more than 250 million students in these studies. The way to say, given that I have limited time and limited resources, where's the most effective way for me to invest my teaching and my leadership energy? Uh, Dr. Hattie uses the uh, zone of desire, desired effects, and we don't have to get into a big statistical digression about this, except to say that there's good news and bad news when you study education research. The bad news is that you can claim almost anything works, if works meaning better than zero. You know, a, a teacher with a pulse, a, a program that isn't entirely horrible, can have a positive effect. But as Hattie says, positive isn't good enough. It's got to be not just statistically significant, it has to be practically significant. And the zone that he establishes for that is an effect size of 0.4 or higher. Now, why is that important? That not only will eliminate a lot of well-intended but only marginally effective programs, giving you the ability to focus on what's most effective, but one thing to bear in mind is that socioeconomic status, which all of us know, they have a significant impact on student achievement, is an effect size of 0.4. Four nine. Wouldn't it be nice to focus teaching and leadership strategies on things that are not only high impact, but actually a greater impact than socioeconomic factors? That's how we can really make maximum use of your time and really respect teacher and leader time as well. Which, in another key area, this is what we pulled on also, we're just thinking about the next generation assessments. De depending on the consortium that you're in, whether it's PARC or the Smarter Balance, um, what we're seeing is that they're becoming more and more aligned as they're putting more uh, information out on their websites and we start looking at those. But what we do know for both, how they're going to assess in 2014-2015, is going to change the game. And that they're both going to include performance assessments or performance tasks, depending on, on your uh, sort of there. But either way, what we're looking at is a, a new way of being able to, to assess a student and their, their critical thinking skills. So even though there will be like a multiple choice test and, and those kinds of things will still exist, they're going to start offering a performance assessment or performance task for students that will really have to kind of focus in on one real-world task that they're going to have to work through, they're going to have to persevere, it's going to take some time for them to, to um, 
get used to this new way of testing. They'll be working on one particular problem for, as I said, a session or two. They haven't defined what a session is, so it's whether it's a classroom hour or period. But they're going to have to work on that and really um, follow through. So there's many different ways that a performance assessment is going to become necessary, um, not waiting until 2014, 2015, but that teachers need to start bringing this type of assessment into the classroom the sooner the better so that they can get a feel for what this type of assessment is and that students can start practicing and understanding what is being asked of them. So let, let me just amplify a couple of issues on assessment. Uh, certainly I have great hopes for the quality and creativity of the new items in these banks. But I also would be less than candid with you if I don't raise a couple of red flags. Number one, creative assessment is still going to happen at the classroom level. Indeed, one of the things that we cannot do, and the mistakes that, was made, that, that were made 15 years ago was, well, we're, we'll wait and see what the assessments look like, and then we'll get our curriculum under control. The most creative assessments, the assessments that matter, the assessments that give students feedback every day are those that classroom teachers are going to be developing and using as part of their learning activities, the way that they give feedback in a creative, collaborative uh, manner. Moreover, we also know that there are some skills that are essential, like collaboration, like various elements of critical thinking, and certainly like communication, that won't be assessed by a standardized test. So there remains a great role for teacher-created assessments to play. Indeed, when we work with rigorous curriculum design to take the standards and turn them into evidence of student proficiency, that level of teacher ingenuity and creativity are clearly important. Um, so uh, one final thing. Don't, um, a lot of people have been upset about all the external requirements that have been imposed, whether it's by assessment consortium or their states or other external headquarters. It's not intellectually consistent for us to say that we don't like that external intrusion and then at the same time say, but we're not going to do anything until they tell us what to do. There are clear things that we can do right now. A couple of other questions that have been raised from the field. The recommended book, that was Visible Learning for Teachers. So the book that we showed you was Visible Learning. This is a brand new one, Visible Learning for Teachers. The author is Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E. And another question was where you can find examples of the consortia's performance events or tests. Uh, do you want to give those websites, Lisa? Um, yes, you could. I can um, post them in the after um, in the document. Right. Both, both, both Smarter Balance and Park have websites where there are already available um, uh, already available uh, uh, examples. You could probably just Google Park P A R C C or Smarter Balanced. Uh, consortium, but we'll send you the exact website when we publish these uh, handouts in just about an hour. Um, and um, to, oh, I was going to say a book to reference um, performance assessments or performance tasks with a lot of Common Core examples. It's called Engaging Students Through Performance Assessment, and that is uh, by Tracy Fletch, F L A C H, and that can be found on our website, I believe that's a book that will be on your document after, that you can download your handout afterwards also. Oh, great. Thanks for remembering that. Okay, so let's proceed to... You know, and this was just to, as, a, as we um, get to our question and answer session here with Doug shortly, it's just to really thinking about that even though there's more complex instruction, uh, we have more skills that we're working on. That, that we're going to allow these, these students that we need them to know to be able to be career and college ready. But it's not these challenges that define our, our generation of teachers, however, but our response to that. And a lot of that right now is our response and how we're responding to the Common Core. But luckily, this is across the United States. We have 46 states, so you're not alone in it now. It's not just your state or your district. But now we can really open up and see what is going on across the country. We can help each other. The collaboration is outstanding and allows for us to share what best resources we have. We're going to go to your questions about the Common Core here in just a minute and really make this webinar as interactive as we can. But I do want to make sure that we understand that there is a call for action now. I'm, I'm concerned by the number of districts 
that are, are basically saying, I was just asked this last week, uh, why work on curriculum now? Why work on assessments now? We're already busy and it's been a stressful year. We can wait until 2013-14. And I think that is a prescription for a train wreck. And here are the two areas, if you don't believe me, that I'd like you to at least investigate in your schools. Simply go to your elementary, let, let's say K-5 schools, and look at about 15 or 20 writing portfolios. And I want you to count the percentage of informative writing assessments compared to all the other types of writing that students are doing. Every time I do that, bar none, there's a tiny fraction that is writing to persuade, writing to compare, writing to explain, compared to lots of other sorts of writing. Now look, I don't have anything against poetry, creative writing, and narratives, but I'm saying that they are way out of balance right now, and your own content analysis might reveal that. The second area of concern that I have is the expectations we're going to be placing on our middle school mathematics teachers to close a very wide gap between what 7th and 8th graders are going to be expected to do in 2014 and what they are doing now. And again, I would simply invite you to look at some of the student work that's there right now and see if that corresponds to the expectations of the Common Core. Don't be surprised if your math faculty says, if you want us to take kids who are now struggling with number operations, and have them proficient in algebra in eighth grade, we're going to need more time than a one period a day math <coughs> section, which is often interrupted with other things. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask you to, we have several questions mounting up, and I'm going to get to those in just one minute. But one of the things that we always like to ask you is what other things you'd like to see in future webinars. So Lisa and I will start responding to your questions. But if you'd help us know what you'd like to learn about, we offer these free webinars all the time, all over the world, and we want to make sure that we're serving you. So let's begin with these questions. Um, let's see. Is it possible to see everyone else's questions? Uh, that would be helpful. Maybe I haven't thought of it myself. I regret uh, that, that it is not. Uh, part of it is, of course, that we're just respecting everybody's uh, privacy. Um, and so when I speak publicly, I am starting to put those up there, but I don't reveal people's um, names. And the webinar protocol actually has your, has your name there. Um, let's see. Does anyone have a district-wide writing program that they are implementing? Oh, man, I've seen some excellent district-wide um, writing programs. Uh, Lisa's more of an English language arts specialist than I am, but I'll just tell you one that I wrote about, and then, Lisa, if you would jump in. I, I, I wrote about this one in the uh, American School Board Journal, and so there's an article about it, if you'd like where K-12, they were writing in every subject, every grade, every month. Now, they had an abbreviated writing prompt, just uh, uh, abbreviated writing uh, um, rubric, only half a page, very easy and accessible to people outside of English language arts. Teachers got to choose their own prompt so it was relevant to their curriculum. They chose their own grade. They had, and this is, by the way, a high poverty, high ESL system, dramatic gains, not just in writing, but in reading comprehension and in lower failure rates. 60% um, lower discipline rates, lots of good things happen when kids communicate better. Uh, Lisa, what else would you say about district-wide writing? Um, I would just say that it's, it's a process, not a program. And just like Doug said, that you, you can have a school-wide writing prompt, have each teacher or each discipline area be able to write to that. And you can have a rubric where the English language arts teacher maybe hits uh, conventions more than, than the other teachers, but you want to be able to have that common rubric. A great starting point when we're talking about writing and what to expect of students, and if uh, you go and look at what teachers are doing and in, in requiring students to write, is please know there's a great resource, the Common Core ELA State Standards, there's three appendices. Appendix C has great examples of student exemplar writing pieces, kindergarten through 12th grade of what proficient writing should look like by the end of the year. They also annotate those pieces of writings to show how it meets those standards. So again, when the teachers are looking at writing, make sure they're going back to the standard and don't fall into a certain sort of program, say, but uh, keep following back to the standards. But that Appendix C is a great starting point for teachers to talk with teachers about the writing and, and look at it against grade level. It's not just English language arts, but they have other subject areas also in the three text types of writing. Um, but it's also to be something that could be shared in the classroom with students so that they have 
exemplar pieces if your teachers have not collected those or have those at this point. Um, some, some people, I think, you had anticipated a question, Lisa, when people said, well, where do I start? Is it really necessary for every teacher to deconstruct the standards? You know, I realize that when teachers are feeling overwhelming, overwhelmed, it is very tempting when somebody will come in and say, I'll tell you what, I'll just deliver it to you and you read the script. But friends, we've tried that for the last 10 years. And if you want to ask teachers one thing that infuriates them more than anything else, it's the attitude of, don't you bother your pretty little head trying to actually analyze this work. We'll do that for you. You just read the script. Teachers are offended by that. And so I do think that deconstructing the standards, asking the Larry Ainsworth question, which is at the heart of the wonderful book, uh, Rigorous Curriculum Design, that's Rigorous Curriculum Design by Ainsworth, which is not just what its standards say. We already know that. The more complex question is, what's the evidence that my students must give to demonstrate that they're proficient at the standard, and preferably, what's two or three different ways that they can give evidence that they're proficient? Moreover, some of you are in high-performing schools. There's a risk that your students are going to be bored. Every teacher can add intellectual value to these standards by saying, how can I construct tasks that allow students to demonstrate proficiency beyond the standard? Uh, because there are plenty of things that no standardized test won't address. So when our teachers start thinking about multidisciplinary assessments, uh, tasks beyond the standards, tasks that can be done collaboratively, tasks that will require communication using technology, communication using writing, communication using speaking, none of that's going to be in outsourced assessments. And I, I see that as a great opportunity to re-engage the hearts and minds of, of teachers. Uh, will there be a set of common rubrics? There are already sample rubrics that are posted on the web um, at the Common Core websites, but beware. One of the things that my research has demonstrated conclusively, just as I said that standards are not enough, is that rubrics aren't enough. It's, it's the three blind men and the elephant. You can have three people looking at the same rubric and coming to different conclusions. That's why I'm a big believer. You can use that as a starting point, but you want to make it yours, owned by Oakdale Elementary School, Washington High School. This is our writing rubric. And we've practiced it enough times so that we know that eight out of 10 times, teachers looking at the same work will come to the same conclusion. Moreover, we've removed a lot of the typical jargon so our kids understand it as well. Um, how do we develop and implement interdisciplinary research projects? I think that's uh, really something that is coming back in a wonderful way. And it's nice to see. You might have seen in the New York Times a few weeks ago that uh, some people are giving up, essentially, on interdisciplinary research and, and term papers just as a dying art and let them substitute for blogs instead. If you've read the Common Core, you know that there is argumentation and evidence throughout that. And so an ideal interdisciplinary project wouldn't just be between English and science, but would also allow students to explore different sides of an issue. Uh, just in Boston the other day, uh, people have kind of laughed at some of the political debate about going to the moon. But there were students involved who were studying space exploration very seriously and the implications that it might have positively and negatively. That's the sort of thing that brought in science and mathematics and social studies and English in, in just an amazingly thoughtful way. Um, would you demonstrate the unwrapping of the standard? Let me stop. And, um, and Debbie, if you could just, uh, uh, I mean, Lisa, I'm sorry, if, if you could uh, maybe just give us a quick example of what we mean going from a standard to an unwrapped standard. OK, so if you were looking at a particular standard, let's just say, let me just pick one for an example here. Um, let's say it says, support claims with clear reasons and relevant evidence using credible sources and demonstrating an understanding of the topic or text. So when we are talking about um, first of all, you want to prioritize your standards. So maybe that's when we pick we're going to prioritize our, our students really need to be able to do this well. We're going to unwrap. By unwrapping, uh, we can look for the skills and for the concepts. And then generally, when you look at the verbs, you're finding the skills. So for example, in that one I read to you, support claims with clear reasons and relevant evidence. The word support there support and then is going to be the, the skill. Students need to be able to support in their writing. Support what? Claims with clear reasons and relevant evidence. 
So we're looking at the student needs to be able to support. What is it they need to support? They need to support the claims. So there's the skill they need in their writing and the concept that they need in their writing. Continuing on, it says using credible sources and demonstrating an understanding of the topic or text. Again, tend to look at the verbs to find the skills. So using and demonstrating are the skills they need in their writing. Using what? What's the concept? Well, credible sources and um, understanding of the topic. So, so really knowing that. So as you unwrap, and if you look at Larry Ainsworth's work, there's a, there's a set guideline for you to do to do that. But typically, if you can look for the for the nouns and, and the verbs, you you really start to tear apart and and have these conversations. Now it's both skills where when teachers are talking and doing this because we want we do not want to do this in isolation. We want to be collaborative. So when teachers are looking at this, here's the power of the unwrapping. For example, support claims. Teachers need to discuss support. What does that mean? What is that skill? What does that look like in writing? What's the Bloom's taxonomy? What's that critical thinking skill we're asking our students to do in this writing? Or the using or the demonstrating. What does it mean to demonstrate? What are we looking for? What's the Bloom's level there? So it's that collaborative nature that teachers have around the standard where they deeply learn that standard, but then they come to a collaborative consensus of what is this going to look like in the classroom. So for example, I was just I just pulled off a sixth grade writing uh, sub uh, standard there for you. And that sixth grade, so those sixth grade teachers, if they're having this conversation, now if I have five sixth grade teachers, they're all teaching, knowing and understanding that same standard with each other, that it will look and reflect in the classroom more one and the same. They'll be looking for that same critical thinking level in each of their classrooms. So it's the collaborative nature of the unwrapping that is the real powerful piece. And at the end, at the end stage of that, what we want to get to is different ways that students express evidence of not only proficiency, but also evidence of exceeding a standard. That's where I think teacher creativity uh, comes in, from kind of a compliance document into a lively and engaging description of what we do in the classroom. We have several other questions that I want to try to get to before we get out of time. Um, uh, one of our colleagues says, I'm concerned that there's not enough time to both read and to be exposed to complex text. You're exactly right. Um, given the very clear demands of, of advancing levels of text complexity, complexity and the assumption that students already know how to sound out words and word blends, a 90-minute reading block won't be enough for many schools. And those are kind of the practical issues I'm asking leaders to think about. Just as I said a minute ago, I think the time allocated in middle school mathematics is going to be insufficient where you will have an eighth grade train wreck. Uh, similarly, uh, our, our writer here notes, if you want to give kids time to deeply engage in reading, Read slowly, write about what you've read, discuss what you've read. Those are all great ideas if you can actually attack the words. But if you can't do that, then the students are going to need both that reading time, and they're also going to need the time to uh, develop skills. And it's easy to say, well, gee, they're fourth graders now. They should have had that in first grade. Well, yeah, they, they should have had a lot of things. But we all deal with the daily reality that we have students who are behind where they need to be. And so I want to challenge you. if. If you spent 90 minutes a year last year and you didn't reach proficiency for your students, why in the world would you continue to spend 90 minutes and expect different results? It really is going to, as our questioner says, require different time allocation. And closely related to that is the next question on the needs for special education students. Uh, there isn't nearly enough, in my judgment, in the official documents about adaptation of special ed. That's why we need our special educators to really um, add value to standards by helping us understand what may seem like a leap from one column to the next that looks like one increment of learning to, in the hands of a skilled special educator, they may say, no, Doug, for my students, that there's going to be four intermediate steps there. And that's not just one, one leap of inference or one leap of, of skill, but many incremental leaps. That's what great special educators do all the time. And I think that's a, that's a crying need. But let me also say an opportunity. I, I, nobody wants to hear that we're making more work for teachers. But I want you to think about the alternative. The alternative is slapping down some notebooks and saying, here they are, read them and weep. Teachers, 
do want to be engaged, and they want it, their intellect to be respected, and that's yet another way of, um, of, of doing that. Um, let's uh, continue to take a look at some of these additional questions before we run out. One thing I'd like to just um, jump in and say with regarding special ed and ELL, the spiral nature of the standards really do help the, the, the at-risk students to find out where they are at and where they can come in. So the, how they're spiraled is, is, is at least helpful in those areas. Uh, there's, there's two questions, um, one on the role of technology that I'm going to let you take and the other on the role of higher ed. Uh, and I would welcome this uh, a, a professor who has joined us to talk about what higher ed is doing to prepare for the Common Core Standards. I think the nation is really thirsty for models of effective uh, teacher preparation. Uh, as, as the professor knows better than I do, they are the uh, favorite punching bag of a lot of critics. And whenever I'm asked, I'm always equipped with the ability to present some great teacher uh, preparation programs that are out there that deserve more publicity. And if you've got some that you're willing to contribute to that litany of examples, I would love to uh, learn more about it. And uh, I'll put my personal email up here at the end. But uh, I'm, I'm a sponge for that. What about technology? What exactly is the question? Yeah, the, the, the role of technology in the Common Core State Standards. Oh, the role of technology. Well, you will, you see it in the actual standards themselves. So there will be um, the multimedia and, and different things right in the standards as, as you learn and go through them. You'll see exactly where it comes in, um, starting way down at the, at the kindergarten level, um, really starting to look at this. What's really exciting, I think, for, for a lot of districts is to know that in 2014, 2015, that the assessments will be um, almost all computer-based. And what that means for data is that's a quick turnaround in data where uh, schools will be able to get the results within two weeks or less. So there will still be some human scoring on the side of the writing, but in regards to um, the technology, for example, the state of Utah already um, has their assessments online, um, but this is going to be something that is geared 2014-2015. For schools not equipped for the technology, you will have a few years where you can still take it um, paper and pencil as you're waiting for your technology to roll out. But that's what is really exciting is how quickly you'll be able to get your data turnaround. And they will be offering formative assessments too so that students can practice and teachers can kind of get a gauge on their instructional practices and what they need to change before the actual testing of, or I should say the assessing of the new uh, assessment. Um, there were several questions on on examples of how they might be able to practice unwrapping standards and going through the process mm -hmm. that we've been, been describing. Certainly these summits that you see in front of you offer good opportunities for actual coached practice to do precisely that. In addition, let me recommend Larry Ainsworth. Uh, we've already talked about his rigorous curriculum design. That is his latest book. An earlier book called Unwrapping the Standards would be one that I would commend to you that will give you exact actual examples step by step of, of how to do that. And uh, I think you're wise to let people take some things that, that they've already done. Moreover, I forgot to mention something that might lower the blood pressure of your colleagues a little bit, and that is to go through the Common Core with a highlighter and identify some of those standards that you're already doing. It's simply not true that all of these are brand new and it's fruit basket upset. Some of these you'll say, wait a minute, I'm already doing that. And you'll be able to identify both unwrapped standards, performance assessments, and effective instructional interventions based on those standards. So at, at the same time you're taking on new responsibility, give yourself credit for the things that you have already been doing that are consistent with these uh, re requirements. Um, we've got some great ideas for some future performance uh, uh, for some future uh, webinars that I certainly will uh, take into account. Here is another question, a recommended way for comparing old standards uh, to the new ones for unpacking. Um, it's not just that the subject matter is the same. You want to look at the performance levels. And one of the things I really like about the Common Core documents, and let's face it, everybody, including me, has taken a few shots, but here are some good things. They actually include examples of student work so you can say, when the standard says X, what does it look like in the hand of a seventh grade student? And, um, and, and, they sh and they show those at different levels. Those are free, they're worth downloading, and I commend it. Ultimately, remember, that's just a start. I think
think what I really want my vision is for schools and districts to begin their own archives of great student work and of effective teaching practice. But it's a nice place to start, so it makes the standards sort of come alive for you. We have time for just a couple of more questions that I'm going to try to get down to. Um, lots of recommendations for webinars that I will um, that we'll talk about offline. Um, and and you've, you've put together a marvelous curriculum here. You've put together about a master's degree worth of curriculum and instruction, which we will make sure that we respond to. Ah, here's one that we haven't heard about yet. Um, what about English language learners? The challenge of the Common Core is even more so when um, more of our students are levels one or two in speaking English. Um, why don't you begin, Elisa, and then I'll tell you some of the challenges that we're facing uh, in our part of the country. OK. Well, the, the one thing that the Common Core does, and again, there's not enough information there for ELL and at special special ed students and, and our most at-risk students. However, you can really look to, once you know the standards and the spiral effect, because every English language arts standard is, or strand, I should say, is spiraled kindergarten through 12th grade. So what we call it is at, at a, it's a strength model. So let's say you have a sixth grade ELL student in the sixth grade classroom, or any sixth grade student that may be struggling and not at the proficiency level. You can look back at a, any particular standard and find out what can they do. You can back it down to fifth grade. Can they do this? Yes, OK, we need to move on, on to sixth grade. If not, go down to fourth grade or third grade. Or maybe they're coming into you at a first grade level. But now to the spiraled nature of the Common Core standards, we can look at that student and say, here's what they currently can do. Now we can accelerate and speed up their progression up to sixth grade by starting first grade, and we know to pinpoint what they need to do to get to second grade, to get to third grade, as you build up that standard. So instead of dragging the student out of the classroom or, or doing something different that tends to slow them down or throwing worksheets at them, we now have a pinpoint uh, standards that will really help us actually accelerate and, and move forward. And that's great for a special ed. Um, teachers also because they can directly place that on an IEP to say, here's where the student is currently at. And that's why we call it strength-based. It's not here's what they can't do, but here's what they're coming in, here's what they can do. Now how do we accelerate them up? Yeah. And closely related to that is, is another question about, about newcomers. And when, when we have students who, who come to, to our schools who not only are not speaking English, but they have not been in school for the first 12 years of their life, it's really uninformative to call that an ELL issue. But that is a culture issue, and we have a significant challenge that we have to address there. And at that point, I think some sort of human compassion takes over rather than saying, what tests shall the child be, be taking? And that, that is a growing problem. Um, Certainly, in the East, I suspect it is in many of your areas as well. Um, the, uh, fortunately, we've documented some, some good cases where that has been working. Uh, your questions have simply be, been thoughtful and overwhelming, and I'm not going to be able to get all, to all of them. One that you did ask is, do we have a, uh, some examples on tape of how te teachers are dealing with this? We actually have a growing tape um, library, and one of the things that you can all already see is that we've done tape on how teachers are improving their instructional practices based upon the way that they're analyzing student work. Now, that is not explicitly related to the Common Core, but as we do more of these, we're going to have more and more examples of non-scripted, completely authentic teacher work sessions so you can see the questions that they raise and how effective leaders allow teacher leadership to, um, to uh, be powerfully effective in, uh, in improving practice. Uh, those, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you more about um, about some of those uh, those slides. But we have we have both um, we have DVDs already, and we'll be we'll be implementing some more of them. Um, so let me try to get to the end where I promised you you could get a hold of um, of us. Those are our uh, emails. If there are questions that you prefer to ask privately rather than on online in the webinar, you're certainly uh, reason uh, you're certainly able to do that. We had many, many more questions than we were able to get to. I promise that we will take those suggestions for future webinars very seriously. And I want to make sure that 
if there are things that you want to ask privately and personally to either Elisa or myself, that we get you individual responses for all those. The complete slides, as well as the uh, audio version of the webinar, will be available uh, in uh, it, just within the uh, the next couple of hours. And um, and the things on the um, uh, somebody asked, are the things on the website free? All the documents are. All the, all the downloads, all of the um, all of the um, past webinars, uh, every article that I've written, dozens of them, more than dozens, I guess are all available as free downloads. Uh, what we ask you to pay for are things like books and DVDs, but, but all the other downloads are completely free, and, uh, and we hope that you'll use them and share them. And if you found this webinar or another useful, you can uh, uh, invite people along. These, these two are free. So thanks so much for your very kind attention. Thanks, Lisa, for spending some time with us today. We'll look forward to seeing you. And thanks to you, um, as colleagues, you've given us some great new ideas uh, for future webinars. Have a great rest of the day, everybody.